so going to miss that epic music as we start next month. Uh, Crystal told me before service, so she came up, she's like, uh, you, you do realize I can like hear everything that you're saying right now? I was like, oh yeah, I was like, I was testing my mic and then I pulled the communion mic over to test it as well. And then Brian came up right before service, he goes, they can like hear everything you're saying in the nursery. And I went, yeah, yeah, there's a reason that I did that because I did not mute myself. So luckily I did not go use a restroom so we didn't all have to be put through that. Guys, I feel like, you know, as, as Brian talks about, like, a groan, I feel like we all just need, like, to get a collective groan out this morning, so it's just out of our system, so on the count of three, one, two, three, uh, there we go, didn't that feel, that felt, like, cathartic, didn't it, all right, and then on the other side of it, to lead us in for this morning, on the count of three, we just give a big old, like, whoop, or something like that, I don't know, whatever, whatever you want to do with that, right, one, two, three, woo, wow, now, it's a little sad to me that the groan was way more emphatic and way more emotional than the woo. All right, so let's try that again with feeling and a one and a two and a three. Woo! There we go. Awesome. And that leads us right into this morning. And I want you to think, and what do you think about when you consider eternity, forever, the future? Yep. About that right there, huh? What most people picture, and when they think of eternity, they think of it as somewhat like, as one person has described it, has anybody ever been to the great state of Texas? Anybody? I have never been to Texas, but they say, and I think that most people think eternity is like a West Texas highway. And by that, they mean a long flat, monotonous, boring stretch of road. That's what most people think of. Now, I've never been to Texas. I've never been on a West Texas highway, so I will insert here what I know to be true. If you have ever found yourself on any road going through Kansas or Nebraska, that's kind of the same thing, isn't it, right, boys and girls? And honestly, and sadly enough, that's what most people think of when they think about their future. Like, this is I like, guess is it? Like, boys and girls, if you've never been to Kansas and Nebraska, there's nothing. I mean, you're like, is there a, do people live in this state? I'm really confused right now. That's what most people think of when they think of eternity. That the thought is that after we die and we leave this earth, all the big events of life are, are, are already behind us. We've already lived everything. And so what's there really to look forward to? What's there to keep our eyes on? But my friends, <laughs> Scripture and Jesus through his word reveals something else entirely different than a long, monotonous, boring road. Jesus actually reveals, and what we've been talking about this entire month and we'll conclude today, Jesus reveals through much of his teaching, that actually most of our life, and here we go, I'm ready to, you're, you ready to get your brain scrambled a little bit this morning, all right? Most of life happens after our physical death. In truth, there are what one author has proposed, and I think they're pretty right. I was like, I like, like simple, boiled down things. He says that there are six events, I call them six crossroads in your life. I have them here on the screen listed out. The first one is obvious, life. It's the life that we live here on this earth from point A to point B, all right? And then comes what? Death. Just as you are ushered into this life, very suddenly you are ushered out of this life, very suddenly. If we're lucky, the Psalms say we have 70 years at best, maybe more. And then we move on through life and death, and it leads us straight to our next crossroad that is very, very important. We've been talking a lot about the last few weeks, our eternal destination. Life, death, destination. Talked a lot about that last week, and we talked about Matthew 25. Our destination, and I don't want you to misunderstand this, nor anybody to misunderstand this, our destination is solely decided by whether we believed and trusted in Christ while we had the opportunity here on this earth. Brian just mentioned that a little bit ago. Did we express our faith and have faith in Christ? Jesus only ever, 
And I hope we've seen this in his teaching. He only ever identifies two possible locations that your destination will be. Heaven, and we talked about it last week, what? Nobody wants to say that word, do they? You know, heaven and hell. That's it. There's no, like, midway point. There's no, like, purgatory. There's heaven or hell. Both of them have an eternal future. They will last forever. Which leads us to resurrection, a bodily resurrection. We understand that we are made up of body, spirit, and soul, all right? We're not just a body. We're not just material matter. And so although we die physically on this earth and we are buried and put in the ground, our spirit and our soul live on. Most scholars believe the Bible would teach that when we die, we are present with Jesus in a pre- what's called present heaven, all right? While our bodies stay there in the ground, there will come a time at the end of all things, Scripture attests to it very clearly, that there will be a bodily resurrection of not just all believers, but all people eventually. They will be united back to their bodies. And then there will be what we are going to talk about this morning, which is honestly a bit of a complex um, mess with your mind kind of things because we don't usually talk about this nor think about this because we're all very humble and good Christians. But this morning, what I want to talk about, and it's one of these crossroads, is what I would call reward blessing or what some people would call repayment. And as, as soon as I say that word, some people are like, what? Wait a minute. Like, Jesus doesn't need to be repaying us for anything. I want you to erase everything that you know and how you experience reward, treasure, and repayment in this life and just get it out of your mind. Because that's usually what colors our idea of what reward and blessing looks like in eternity. But there will come a time when people will be judged. We talked about last week the judgment of the nations. We talked about in Revelation 20, there's a great white throne judgment. And probably some of you walked out here last week. I was like, I don't know what in the world that guy was talking about. I didn't know there were so many judgments. I didn't know they happened at different times. Well, welcome to the Bible, all right? It'll scramble your brain. Believers will experience a judgment specifically for believers. It's what is known, and we'll talk about a little bit later this morning, the Bema seat of Christ. And the outcome of all of those judgments determines what I call your experience, all right? Every believer will get eternity, all right? Every believer who places their faith and trust in Christ will have eternity with Jesus forever in heaven. But it's not like we just show up in heaven and then we're like, that was, that was, nah. That's like just the starting point, guys. What we experience in eternity has a lot to do with what happens here on this earth. The choices that we make, the actions that we take, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And then the last crossroad is eternity itself. Eternity waits every single person. And again, how you live on this earth determines what the experience of eternity is going to be like. I'm going to flesh that out a little bit. We're going to talk about that a lot this morning. Six crossroads, six events of life, just a very quick, that, by the way, guys, that was a very oversimplified version of eternity, all right? That was eternity in like three minutes. But that quick journey through six events makes it apparent, guys, I, I hope that you get this very, very clear this morning. Just how much is at stake in what lies ahead and how the choices that you and I make every single day and the actions that we take right now have eternal implications. And and I'm not talking about like, oh man, I had to make a really big decision the other day. I'm talking about like even just tiny little, like you're like, that's such an insignificant decision. No decision is way insignificant. No action that we take is just an aw shucks, like whatever, that wasn't really a big thing. It all matters to God. I do not want you to miss this morning a crucial connection that we're going to talk about a lot. If you look at these six main events, life, death, destination, resurrection, reward, blessing, and eternity, you will notice how life, at the very beginning, lived right now, the years that we have on this earth, directly impacts everything after it. And you should be sitting there right now going, oh, geez, like that just got real. That just got heavy. This is God's word. It is true. It can cut us. It can weigh on us. Guys, between, 
life on earth and every other event that comes after it, there is what one author calls an invisible one-way connection. I will call it this morning an unbreakable link. Again, I say this, I've said this like three times now, but I just want to keep saying this. Our choices, our actions on earth have a direct impact on eternity. The choices we make, the steps that we take in this life, don't come to nothing when we die. Just like, all right, we, we're, we died, we're leaving this earth, we're just leaving everything that's ever been done right. It just, that's not how the Bible paints the picture. In fact, the direct opposite is actually true and what we need to live into. Guys, our decisions and our actions and our choices matter. And they will continue to matter for all of eternity. We don't just show up into eternity and Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in, celebrate with me. We've read those words, right? But I believe that as I read scripture, there's something else. There's something else that God has for us in his goodness and in his grace that we really should be thinking about. This idea of reward and blessing. And I know, I know, there, there are some of you who are sitting right now that are going, I don't, I don't know, I already don't know what he's, what he's saying just sounds really, really weird. Just, can you humor me until we get to a point and we're really going to lay all this out? And I'm not here to try to convince you of anything. I'm here to only show you, this is what scripture says, and I think we probably should look really close at this, and we should study this a lot more than we do. Now, do I think this is the greatest thing that we need to strive for in life and the thing that we need to hold above everything else in our faith? No, not really. But it does inform our faith. And it is very important in understanding what we've been talking about this whole month. What does Jesus say about the future? And there are two truths, guys. These are very, very important. You probably should write these down because it will help things make much more sense as we move through this. Two truths or two keys that determine our eternity and our experience of eternity. And the first one is really, really important. Like, don't even worry about reward blessing if we can't get past this first one. It's belief. It's faith. What we believe impacts all of eternity the consequence of what we believe in our faith on earth absolutely matter because it locks in our destination belief determines i underlined it and i made it yellow up there where we spend eternity are we on the same page with that one it's pretty it's that's that's like every good christian really really knows that they've got they've got number one locked down I believe, I believe with all of my heart. I, I live in faith that I put my faith in Christ and I trust you and I obey you and I submit to you and my destination is secured. We should have such an inner peace and a joy at that. Absolutely, we should. It, but, but if belief is the starting gate, what I kind of call the starting gate, and it determines the where we spend eternity, then what we do and how we do it and how we obey our actions and our works have something to do in determining how we will spend eternity. Or if belief determines destination, what our works reveal determines our, what I call, again, experience of eternity. Now again, I know I want you to be confused, and you're like, wait a minute, like, so he's, he's no, I, I'm saying that if you place your faith in Jesus, you will end up in heaven, and there will be a great, great eternity. But as I'm going to say later on towards the end of the sermon, and I'm going to, what, what I believe scripture reveals, here is what we will be doing in heaven. Here is what I think it means to be rewarded, to be repaid, to be blessed, for what we have done on this earth. And it doesn't have anything to do with cha-ching money, like we're going to get like piles of money. Like, what? like what, what's that going to have to do with eternity? It's so much bigger than that, guys. It's so much greater than that. I want you to consider what we read last week. Last week we, we ended Matthew 25 in the Olivet Discourse, and Jesus had words for a group of sheep and a, and a group of goats. And he, he turns and he talks to one of the groups, the sheep, and he says all of these things. Hey, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me some clothes. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. And they all go, what do they do? Like, Jesus, when did that happen? We don't even remember doing anything for you. 
And he says what? I assure you, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. And then he gives us this line in verse 34 of Matthew 25, and he says this, and there's a very important word that's in here. He says to the sheep, the king will say to those who are on his right, come to me, you who are blessed. There is that word. That word is very, very important throughout all of scripture and especially the New Testament. You are blessed by my father. And what's that word right there? I didn't hear you. Inherit. Inherit. That's a very, very important word for this entire section. And this whole teaching on what it means to enter into the kingdom. Inherit the kingdom that I have prepared for you from the creation of the world. The, again, the key word there is inherit. Inherit conjures up what kinds of images in your mind. And I know in my mind, inherit conjures up, it's, it's, it's a very family kind of term, isn't it, right? An inheritance is a, a gift. You, you don't earn an inheritance. I guess you could like really argue with me you're like well no if you don't do certain things and they take you out of the will and you don't get the inheritance no okay so the basic idea of the inheritance is you didn't do anything I was just talking this week I actually had a conversation with Eddie yesterday and last week I found myself up at a farm around Muncie Indiana and the guy said you know what if I did not inherit this land I would not be a farmer there's no way that I could just decide one day right now in 2022 I want to be a farmer I had to inherit this land as a gift he didn't do anything for it it's given to you your dad your grandparents or great great grandparents give you inheritance it's passed down it's passed on they work for the money in the land but they give it to you in what seems like a very free way to the next generation and then you in turn give it to the next generation eddie how many years did you say your farm has been in your family all right 200 220 years. Boys and girls, that's a long time. <laughs> and here we have Eddie today, in 2022, has just inherited that land. This, this word inherit that Jesus uses in Matthew 25 speaks to both our inability to earn our way to eternity, but it also speaks to something about our experience of eternity. Guys, inherit automatically conjures up the image of gaining something of value, eternity, but it also the treasures and the rewards that are, as Jesus would say in Matthew earlier, stored up in eternity. He says that, doesn't he? Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. He says, don't worry about this stuff down here on earth. Don't worry about your money. Don't worry about your treasures. Don't worry about the things that you think you really value, what you really need to be doing. And he says this. These are very, very important words how he says this. Store up for yourselves. Now, that's a big phrase, by the way. It's not just store up for somebody or store up for Jesus because he needs a whole lot of jewels and crowns in heaven. He will be wearing the biggest crown in heaven, all right? You will know Jesus. He doesn't need money. He doesn't need jewels. He sits on a throne, but he doesn't need that thing, all right? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust and things like that that corrode it and take it away, it cannot be taken away. And just so you don't think that what I'm talking about, this idea of reward and blessing and treasures and storing things up, is an isolated teaching and a concept that I'm making up or making too much of, I want you to consider the other mentions of reward in the Bible. Matthew 16, 27. Matthew 16, 27, it says, For the Son of Man will come with his angels. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it, right? It's the very same words in Matthew chapter 25. Son of man will come with all of his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people, and then I highlighted this phrase, according to their deeds. There's got to be something, and again, not that we are working for something on this earth, but we're working from the point that we are saved, and that according to our deeds, there will be some sort of a measure of reward or blessing. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, he's talking to the rich young ruler here. He wants you to go and sell all of your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have, what's that phrase? Treasure in heaven. We cannot ignore this. And then he says, then come, then you can follow me. Luke 14, 14, and we'll dig into this just a little bit more here in a bit. 
At the resurrection of the righteous, I talked about that already, a crossroad of life, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Those are two very important words, reward and repay. I'm going to dig into that a little bit and tell you what those words really mean, what they have to say to us, guys. That is just a sampling of all that Jesus says, a sampling of all that the New Testament says, a sampling of what all the Bible says about this idea of blessing and reward. What in the world could all of this mean? Because I think we're starters, we're just an appetizer here. Nothing we do in this life, nothing that's done to us is wasted in this life or the next. Guys, God is keeping a close eye on everything. All things will be brought to account in the life to come. We guys have more to gain by serving him faithfully and diligently than we could ever possibly imagine. That's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks. What does it mean to be a faithful servant? But here's the thing, and we've talked about this before, there is a difference between a servant and what the Bible would call, and what culture even calls, a steward. Servants are just told to do things. Like, do this. Go and do this job. Stewards do what, though? They manage resources for the master, for the landowner. They have more of a stake in it than just being simply a slave or a servant. One, one church historian uh, says it this way about this concept of reward and blessing all throughout the Bible. He says, this is not new theology. It has been part of Christian belief and practice from the first century on. Further, all of the greats of church history, whether it be Augustine or Luther or Calvin or Wesley or Spurgeon, whatever you might think about those guys, they all had one thing in common. Can I just let you in on this? It doesn't, even, it doesn't even start at people like Augustine. It goes all the way back to people in the Bible, New Testament people of the faith. Hebrews 11 talks about that. They had this one thing in common. They all seriously believed in and hoped for eternal rewards. Guys, be behavior, our actions, our work, our choices don't supersede faith and belief. In fact, it's been said our belief works where our works don't. Because someone, guys, has already done the work for you. His name is... Which destination, where am I going to go? Heaven or hell? With the wrong key. Works. If I just do enough stuff, that's going to get me to the right destination. But Jesus does teach, and I've read just a little bit of it here, that your works for God on earth can greatly benefit you once you're really say about rewards. I want to use and start off, and I have you turn to Luke chapter 14. We've already read a little bit of this, but I want to get it in context and read the verse that comes around it. Luke chapter 14, verses 13 and 14 specifically, is what we're going to talk about here. And Jesus is talking um, about being invited to a feast. And he says, you don't want to, you don't want to invite like the greatest, richest, most famous people to your feast. He says, in fact, starting in verse 13, instead what I want you to do is I want you to invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. And you're like, this doesn't sound like a very great dinner party. But here's the very important part of it. Why does he tell us to do that? Why does he tell his disciples and the people of that day to do that? At the resurrection of the righteous, again, God will reward. And again, I've highlighted that word because it's very important to understand what the meaning of that word is, and we'll talk about it. He will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Guys, one, one truth here helps to reframe how we approach and live life in the here and the now. We receive, guys, any 
and every lasting reward of importance after we leave this life, when we die. Now, we, we, we experience and get glimpses of the goodness of God and his grace and his blessing and his mercy in our lives, but the great, your greatest moment of mercy and grace that you've had in your life is only a shadow of what God has in store for all of eternity. Jesus said as much in his ministry and in, his, and in the Gospels that we, 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 we're waiting for our reward until later. You remember in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, right? He goes through all of these things. He says, hey guys, I just wanted to let you know, um, if, if you give, and if people give to like puff up their ego and to look really good and to get a great reputation, you know what's going to happen? That's all the reward you know, like, oh, you, good job. You, like, you gave a really, really amazing amount. That's all the reward that they will get. get. They will, they will, it says they will lose their reward from the Father in heaven. Oh, he talks about praying too. If you want to pray and you want to be really flowery with your prayers and be like, make sure everybody's listening. There's always that one person, right? You're like, man, they play, pray really well, but they're also probably the one that's like, is everybody paying attention right now to what I'm saying? Because this is really important. They've lost their reward. They got every bit of reward that they could get right here. And everybody going, ooh, ah. Oh. Jesus talks in Matthew 6 about fasting. You fast, he says. Don't go around and be like, hey, guys, just want to let you know I'm, I'm fasting. I remember in, in college, like one of the one or two times in my life that I've really seriously fasted. <laughs> so immature. I walked around and I was just like, you know, like uh, I had to make a real big deal about it. Like, I'm sorry, I can't really can't really eat that because I'm, I'm fasting right now. Like, people are impressed by that. If that's the reward that you want to get and people like looking at you being like, wow, what dedication. You've lost your reward. It's the only reward that you're going to get. And he says over and over, your father knows. He sees in secret. He will give you your reward in due time. I want to justify everything. Guys, this flies in the face of what most people have ever believed and still believe about reward and blessing. Most people believe that God gives good things right now here on earth. I, the best things that I could have, are they need to come to me, Jesus. If I do good things in my life, you do good things for me, Jesus. And again, while that's certainly true and there's some level of blessing and doing a God thing right now, ultimate blessing, guys, is reserved for eternity. The rewards that Jesus talks about in Luke 14 and those he talks about most in his ministry and in the Gospels are on a completely different level from what we usually think of when it comes to reward and blessing. Guys, they don't just last for a moment. They don't just last for years or a decade or a century, they last 10, 20, 30 billion years and beyond forever. You never lose it. Guys, missing this will have us missing the main point of what Jesus says about reward and blessing and even more falling into disappointment because usually this is what happens in life. I know it because it happens sometimes in my life. Well, God, I am serving so faithfully and i'm serving so diligently why can't i just have some fruit from that why does my life feel like a wreck why do i have poor health why did i get that bad diagnosis why are my finances so stinking low god i'm doing this for you and it comes in this truth guys and I think we know this, but do we really know this and really live this? Serving God now often does not equal gain from him now. In truth, the blessings Jesus really wants for us aren't experienced in the moment, but they're later and they begin with something done today. I told you I had uh, some words for you. The Bible uses two different words most often for reward. The Greek word in places like the Sermon on the Mount that I just talked about in Matthew chapter 6 is the Greek word mythos, which means simply wages. It's plain and simple. You do work, you get a payment, you get wages. In Luke 14 that we just read about inviting and who we invite to the feast, 
Jesus uses the word, I love this word, apodidomai is the word. Apo means back and didomai means to give. And so literally put together, it means give back in return or simply repay. It's the same word, you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, right? The Samaritan takes care of this Jewish man and he brings him to the inn and he says, here, I've taken care of him and, and, and here's some money, but if it's not enough, I will what? I will repay you. I will apodidomai you when I return. The idea that Jesus seems to be delivering is that of a full reimbursement, not just for grand acts of service, like caring for a man half beaten, but also for everyday acts of service and sacrifice. And it's this, guys. Here's what it comes down when it comes to reward. Whatever you feel like you have lost and given up and you have sacrificed on this earth, you will be more than given back in eternity. You, like the disciples are sitting around and they had all just, like all of his disciples had re- deserted him and Jesus says, you guys going to desert me too? And Peter says, Lord, where would we go? You have, you have the words of, of eternal life. And then Peter would later say, he goes, you know, you realize, <laughs> like, Peter, really? Like, really? But we say the same things. Peter goes, God, but Jesus, you do realize the immense sacrifice that we've given for you, right, Jesus? And Jesus is like, oh, Peter, if you only knew. If you only knew the sacrifice that I was about to give. He goes, we've given an immense sacrifice, and Jesus says, and you have. And at the end of all things, you will be given back way, way more than you have ever given up in this life. A hundred times more. A hundredfold is what he says, which actually, when he says a hundredfold, it's actually like a 10,000% return. So again, anything you feel like you've lost, you are going to more than make up for it in all of eternity. Similarly, when the Apostle Paul went to churches and he wrote to churches, he referred to a judgment, and he talked about that a lot, as the Bema, B-E-M-A, seat of Christ. And I think we need to understand that. What is this Bema? What does it mean for believers? How will Jesus evaluate what we did for him? And what could we gain or lose at this evaluation? Paul talks about this a lot. It comes up first in Acts chapter 18 in a moment in Paul's life where he is captured and taken into custody. He's in Corinth and he's been there for a few months when suddenly, as was the case in many cities that he found himself in, he was at odds with the people. They didn't like him. He was dragged into court and he was charged specifically with, this is what it says in Acts 18, judge presided to hear Paul's case. This platform was known and called in Greek what? The bema. It simply means judgment seat. The same word is applied to the place where officials set at Greek athletic contests to evaluate and to reward the athletes. It came to represent authority, justice, and reward. And although Paul in Acts 18 was quickly acquitted and released, this episode must have been etched in his mind and on his heart because he comes back to it in his second letter to the Corinthians. Paul told about a judgment for every believer that would one day come at the Bema, the judgment seat of Jesus. Brian read it this morning already, but I'm going to read it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Paul says this, We must all stand before Christ to be judged. We as believers will stand before Jesus to be tested and to be evaluated. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. There's some action going on here. There's a work going on here. We're receiving it for something. Two important phrases of note that you need to catch in 2 Corinthians 5. We will each receive. This clearly indicates some sort of, at least as I read it and as the Bible explains it, some sort of a reward, a repayment, a blessing. He also says, for the good or evil that we have done in this earthly body, this restricts the repayment to things done while on earth since the judgment of the bema seat of Christ is in heaven after we die. 
It, it seems clear that the scene played out in the city of Corinth in Acts chapter 18 painted a very compelling picture for Paul that he wanted those in Corinth to know and to remember. And simply stated, it's this. It's the same message that we need to hear today. We will all face the Bema seat of Christ. We will all stand alone. We don't get to bring any of our friends along with us and be like, could you just tell Jesus about all the great things about me? Like, well, not you, because you don't have anything good to say, but you, no, we will be alone. You want to talk about the most, like, what, what seems like it would be the most terrifying moment? You alone with Jesus. But it's not. And we will all be evaluated and tested by Jesus alone, not for salvation's sake, not, not to get us into eternity, but for the sake of evaluation and testing, reward and repayment. If you have your Bibles, if, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because there's a very interesting illustration that Paul uses in his first letter to the Corinthians. He's not talking about a platform or a bema. He's talking about a building, the picture of a building representing our works, what we have done, not for destruction, but for refining and for purification. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 10, he says this, Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, at the Bema seat of Christ, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, the builder will receive, what's that word there? A reward. But if the work is burned up, and I have to admit, I've read this verse many times, and I remember reading it as a kid thinking, oh boy, this is what? Fire? And if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. And it seems that when you put all the teachings together and the verses we've talked about this morning, especially what we just read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what starts to come into focus are two purposes of this testing and evaluation of believers. The first purpose seems to be to show something. Listen to the key words again that come up there. It, it will reveal, it will show. In other translation, the phrase becomes, it will become clear what has been done. At this accounting, it will be plain and apparent that we, what we have done or what we have not done, what we have lost and what we have given up. The second purpose is not just to show, but to test. Notice again, you're not being tested on your beliefs or your et ultimate eternal destination. He says here again, the, the builder will be saved. It becomes clear, guys, that what is being tested are actions, works, words, choices, decisions. What each of us does, loses, gives up when it comes to our life will become, and the, the reason that fire is here, again, I told you, is not for destruction or damnation. It's for refining and purification. There will come a time when we stand before Jesus and we'll bring ev everything it says will be brought to account. Like, if that doesn't scare you, by the way, everything, everything's going to be, you're like, I don't want that dragged here. Jesus, no, he says, like, bring it here. It's, it's fine. Fire will hit it, and it will either be refined and purified like gold, silver, or precious stones, or it will go like wood, hay, straw, or stubble, or dry leaves out in your backyard. There is a sense, guys, that when all believers are evaluated, in some sense, everything Perhaps some piles will be stacked higher and I'll stand over there next to mine and go, mm, pile doesn't look very impressive compared to that pile right there. But quantity is not the test for eternity. Quality is. 
And quality is only measured by fire, by testing, or by evaluation, by refining, by purification. Some large piles will go up in flames, is what 1 Corinthians says here. While modest-sized piles will be forged and found to be lasting. I've used this phrase many times before, but it applies very well here. Only one life that we have, and it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. But here is a very important question. What would cause a work, an action, a choice, a decision, all of that to burn like hay or to endure like gold? This is where it becomes very key to determine that the fire would need to test not only what we did, but how we did it and why we did it. It's about demonstration and it's about motivation, which takes us again back to Matthew chapter 25. And again, I told you when Jesus says this, hey, when when you fed me and when you gave me something to drink and when you clothed me and you took care of me when I was sick, you took care of me when I was in prison, what in the world do the sheep say again? Lord, when, when did we do any of that? It really comes down to the end of all things, guys. Not that you did something super duper impressive and Jesus gave you not just one gold star, but three gold stars. It's all about the motivation for what we do, why we do what we do. Are we doing it to puff up our own ego and reputation? Or are we doing it in the quiet, in the secret? Are we doing it to bring honor and glory to God? Are we doing it to build up other people around us? That's what it really comes down to. And I, I want to bring up a question that I know might be going through some people's minds, and it's this. It is a very humble statement. I don't, Ryan, I don't, I don't, I don't deserve any reward. Like, if I, if I spend eternity with Jesus, isn't that reward enough? Why do I need anything more? And then along comes Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, and it says this. Not necessarily about reward, but about the rewarder. It is impossible to please God without faith. Key one, right? Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. The the word for rewards here in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 is a very unique word. It's actually the only time that it's ever used in the New Testament. You remember I told you earlier the two words most often used for reward in the New Testament are mistos and apodidomai. Do you know what this word right here is, rewards? It's both of those things put together. That God is a mistos apodidomai. Try to say that ten times fast, by the way. It literally says here in in Hebrews 11.6 that God is a rewarder who pays back wages in return. Another way, and say it another way, God is a God who chooses to reward because that is who he is. He is generous in his nature. He is abounding in grace and love. He chooses to reward and give blessing generously and gracefully because he cannot help to be or to do anything else because that's who he is. You see, in the end, guys, reward is so much more about who God is rather than about who we are and what we get. That's the truth about rewards and blessing and what comes in eternity but it also matters a great deal what those rewards are and in this interestingly enough like i told you this earlier i think we need to just erase from our minds any idea that god's going to give us a treasure chest full of all kinds of stuff interestingly enough do you really know as i read through scripture and you could read scripture as well too 
Try on Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, if you want to write that down. Try on Matthew 25, 23. Try on Luke chapter 19, 17. What we will likely spend all of eternity doing may come as a surprise because truth be told, much of what we will do in eternity, the reward that we will receive in in eternity seems to be centered on, you ready? Serving. You're like, wait a while, it stopped. That like just seemed like ultimate bait and switch, Ryan. I was ready for you to tell me about all these wonderful, great, amazing things. Serving is what we will be doing in eternity. In fact, Bruce Wilkinson, an author, says, we will desperately, throughout all of eternity, crave to serve. Guys, why would it be any different than what we're called to do in our life here on earth? I mean, think about it. When we express too long our love and our adoration towards someone, words just don't sometimes do it, do they? You can tell somebody, I love you. Words were not enough for God, were they? And so he sent his one and only son to be the sacrifice for our sin, to demonstrate just how much he loved us. Just how much he wanted to not be served, but to serve and to be a sacrifice for Many guys, in heaven, more opportunity to do God's will through loving service will be our highest reward. And wouldn't you know, in God's upside-down kingdom, the way that we serve best in heaven is ruling. The truth that goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible, in the garden, Adam and Eve are asked to do what? Above all things and first and foremost, I want you to do what? I want you to tend the earth. I want you to take care of the earth. I want you to, the word actually there is, I want you to have dominion over the earth. I would take that to mean, I want you to be the rulers of creation. Now we've taken that and we've spun that in a thousand different directions and really distorted it. But that's the, that's the truth. That's the initial call to all of humanity. Guys, ruling in heaven will have nothing to do with power plays and manipulation that we know in this world. It'll have everything to do with serving the purpose for which humanity has been created and our calling for all of eternity. Serve faithfully here on earth. That's what we've been talking about for four weeks now. What does it mean to be a faithful servant? Serve faithfully here and you will be able to rule perfectly throughout all of eternity. Because could it be that a major reason that so many followers of Jesus are not wholeheartedly serving God or fail to believe that he rewards is that we constantly base our expectation of reward and blessing and treasure on visible proof. Show me, Jesus. Show me. Show me why I do all of this. I want, I want proof right now. It's a very interesting At the very end of the Old Testament, the last book in the Old Testament, the last chapter in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, we kind of start to hear echoes of this from the people, from the people of Israel. Malachi 3.14 says this. The prophet says, you, you Israel, you people of God have said, what's the use in serving God? You you people say, what have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? And he goes on and continues on in verse 15. From now on, we will call the arrogant blessed. For those who do evil get rich. Isn't this what sometimes it seems like life works? And those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. Then listen what happens. Those who feared the Lord spoke with each other. And the Lord listened to what they had to say. And in his presence, a scroll of remembrance, a book of remembrance, was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. It sort of sounds like something at the end of the Bible, doesn't it? It sort of sounds to me a little bit like the Lamb's book of life. And when it's open, is your name going to be found there? Those who honored his name. And then God says and steps in here and he says this, they will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. And wouldn't you know it, 
in the way that only God can. If you flip all the way to the end of your Bible and you go all the way to the last chapter of your Bible in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, listen to what it says. Look, I am coming soon. Bringing my, well, there's that word, that pesky word again, reward with me. To, oh, there's that word, repay all of my people according to their deeds. And I love what verse 13 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last, the beginning and the end. And some of you are sitting here and you're going, all right, what in the world does this have to do with me? What it has to do with you and me, guys, is that we don't need to wonder, we don't need to worry, we don't need to fret about what awaits us on the other side of our last heartbeat. Because Jesus came. Eternity doesn't need to hold a threat. It only needs to hold great promise. We don't have to be anxious about failing some sort of test at the Bema because of something that we've never heard or isn't based in truth because Jesus will bring no criterion to the judgment that he hasn't clearly revealed in Scripture and empowered us to meet with his Holy Spirit. I want you to think of everything that I've said this morning with this simple illustration. I think it's the next slide there, Colin. I call it, whoop, keep going. But boom The dot and the line. You see that up there, don't you? The very left-hand side, there's just one little dot, and then there's a line that goes on what seems like it will go on forever. The dot, guys, is small, and it exists in a fixed place. The line, in contrast, begins in one place, but then goes on in one direction infinitely. Now, I'm not a mathematician, and I don't know my math definitions very well, but that is the definition of a line, correct? Something that starts, a oh, crystal's always got to be the one that goes like, well, really? I call it that a poindexter moment, like, I'm going to put my flat. Shuffle your pocket protector there, too, all right? I want you to think, guys, of the dot up here on the screen as your one little short-lived life. And the line as your life after death in eternity going on forever. And the question that I really want to ask you, and I want you to think about as you leave here today, how do you often live your life? Do you live your life For the dot or for the line? I I tell you, I spend a lot of time at my kids' sporting events, and I do a lot of yelling. I call it coaching. I I call it loud encouragement. Crystal doesn't call it that. After, after studying this week, I showed up at Brenna's. She had a scrimmage yesterday. And like, even in the smallest things of life, this applies, the dot and the line. I said, Ryan, you're going to walk into this gym today and you're going to want everything in you to loudly encourage your daughter. Is, it, is, this, is this game about the dot or is it about the line? Do you notice most things in life, guys, are really about and what most people really live for is the dot. And again, that dot is really small. It's really fixed. Guys, we have to start in our lives. Not li- now, I'm not saying like, oh, just don't worry about anything on this earth. Don't worry, don't care about anything. No, just stop living so much for a dot and start living your life on the line. Forever it will go on and you live into that. What have you treated today and every day as the first day of the rest of your life? Because it really is. Everything you've accomplished, everything that you find so important, you offer in exchange to God. I want what you have, God. Every, our our little blip on the radar, our little mist and vapor of a life for God's endless eternity, our palm full of time for God's forever life, our thimble of water for God's Amazon river that he has for us for eternity. 
But again, guys, to get to that moment, what if you knew, what if I told you, better yet, Jesus has, I, I hope he has clearly impressed on your heart this morning that all of the small choices and acts and decisions that you make today add up to a big impact later. Everything you do, everything you say, every act upon, everything you act upon and will have eternal significance. Guys, everything, every single thing we do, even the things that we say like, nobody's even looking at this. Like, is this really even going to matter that I did this? Every single thing will matter forever. I want you to consider this morning as the worship team comes back up here and we want to finish off this morning in this series with a, a, a great, great song, but I want you to really think strongly about the p- question I posed there. I know what the answer is for my life. There are many times in my life, ashamedly enough, that I spend more time worrying about the dot than I do the line. But do not leave here this morning without really truly considering and committing to reconsider every single day of your life, because that's what it takes. I mean, serious, guys, show up in moments and be like, you know what, right now I feel like I'm getting a little out of control, I'm getting a little heated, I'm getting a little irritated. Is this really going to matter for all of eternity? Or is it only going to matter for this little dot here instead of the line? Would you pray with me?